Hello again and welcome to another Warhammer 40k video. Today's video is going to be a bit different to what I normally do. Today is going to be the day of the Tau rant video. So prepare your fish and chips for I am bringing the salt and vinegar. A while ago when I did the uh, Tau reveal, Tau faction focus for 8th edition, I said do you, my law subscribers, want me to do a Tower Rant video? Because that video itself was a little bit ranty. And overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly, the comments came back saying, yes, please do a Tower Rant video. So I'm going to keep my promise. I'm going to do the Tower Rant video today, guys. Be prepared for just hitherto unseen levels of salt. Now, I'm actually, you know, taking this kind of seriously, guys. You know, I've actually, for the first time in a while, I've written down some notes on, you know, why I hate the towel so much. Um, you know, if, normally I just do these things off, you know, on the fly, off the cuff. But today, we've even got a little bit of a script. So, I'm taking this seriously, guys. But let's get on with the video. No more introductions. The first part of this video, I want to talk about the fluff surrounding the towel okay because there the fluff is a good half the reason why i really just can't stand the towel in 40k and let's just start right at the beginning with that third edition codex in the third you know at the very beginning of that codex it talks about the evolution of the towel and the discovery of the towel by the imperium so long, long ago, I think it was in, maybe even in the third, like, you know, the 30K millennium, the 32nd millennium, maybe it was a long time ago. The Imperium, an Imperial Explorator fleet discovered the Tau planet, a full fleet, Explorator fleet discovered the Tau planet. And they found a primitive species that were, you know, banging rocks together to make fire. Uh, but the planet they were on was perfectly habitable. And... The tech priests noted that you know, this was a good planet and that they should take it over. However, then some warp storms come along and these warp storms isolate the planet. And when they dissipate about 8,000 years later, the Tau as we know them are there, technologically advanced uh, with all their amazing stuff. And the first thing that comes up into my head is, well, what happened to the Explorator fleet? There's a, there's a, there is a picture in that Tau Codex of, of of a servitor with an assault cannon arm, you know, being overwatched by some by a tech priest and a bunch of Tau people with spears coming to attack them. What I'm saying is, what happened to the Explorator fleet? They were there. They were on the planet. They were ready to wipe out the Tau's and native species and take that planet for the Imperium. So what happened? Did they just disappear? They were all, you know, like this is what I understand. So this is what I'm trying to get at, guys. Is this is the first instance we have of the legendary Tau plot armor. Because that really is the main issue with the fluff. Is the Tau have such humongous levels of plot armor and divine intervention that it's just insane. And actually really, when you're reading Tau fluff, the suspension of disbelief is very, very easily broken. Because this shit happens on such a regular basis. That it just makes you, as a reader, it just makes it really it difficult to actually take anything being said seriously. So, first off, we had this instance where they should have just wiped out when they were in the primitive stage. But for some reason, all the servitors and the tech priests and everything just disappear. Magically, they just disappear. So, it doesn't get... It gets a little bit better, though. Because the next bit of fluff we have is... You know, major bit of fluff is the first Damocles Crusade, the first one. And the background to this is the Tau have been expanding. They've started trading with outlying human colonies uh, that are part of the Imperium that are, but have been separated or are generally under quite weak and feckless rule. And once the uh, Imperium and the Inquisition gets wind of this, of this alien technology seeping into their borders they launched the first damocles crusade now first thing i want to say is 
It's a rare moment of awesomeness because the crusade is organized in relatively quick time. And number two, it's pretty cool that they launch an actual crusade. They, they recognize the Tau for the threat that they are. And the Imperium launches a crusade straight off the bat. That's pretty cool. And I actually think the third edition fluff writing for the Tau is the best, even with that mysterious where did all the servitors go incident, you know. Um, so the first crusade launches, and it's good at first. It, it is good, because what happens is the Imperium smash the shit out of a number of small to medium Tau planets. They absolutely smash the ever-living fuck out of it. But then they come across a sept world. I think it's Deleth. I can't pronounce it very well. But they come across Deleth, or I just call it a Sept world. And it's a major Tau world, and it's a major, major invasion. And, the, you know, it, it, the Imperium is winning, but they're getting ground down. And the Tau are getting ground down, but it's bloody casualties. It's heavy casualties. But the Imperium is winning. But then, guess what? Divine intervention number two happens. The Imperium decides that they can't take this, we can't do, use this crusade anymore. We can't continue this crusade because the Tyranids have turned up and the Tyranids are a much greater threat. So they take all the crusade forces and remove them from Tau space. And it's just like, what? Like, you're in the middle of a crusade, like, You've got the enemy. You're about if the, if that sept planet had fallen, there was you know the the tower had invested a lot into defending that planet. If that sept planet had fallen, it could have meant the end of the Tau Empire. But no, as always, just as the Tau are about to fall, something comes along that stops them, and it's just a little bit bleh, but. At least it was a good fight. You know, and that's why, I, that's why I will defend the 3rd edition Tau Codex till I die. Because whilst it's a little bit blur, at least at the end of it, it feels like a genuine draw. Like, you know, the Imperium have smashed the fuck out of the Tau. But the, but, and the Tau haven't won. The Imperium have just said to the Tau, look, we could have killed you, but we, we can't. We, don't, we have to go and fight something else right now. The reason why I find it a bit annoying is it's like, well, the Imperium has so many resources. By the time they get all these guys over from the Damocles Crusade to where the Tyranids are turning up, it's, you know, it's going to be a waste of time. But whatever, okay. So, they're my least biggest gripes. But then, it just gets... Then we have the second Damocles Gulf Crusade. So the first instance, is obviously, it's where, I'm just going to call it, you know, where did the Servitors go incident. Second is... Fucking, you know, first divine intervention. Perium decides they need to, they've got bigger fish to fry. But both of those I can kind of get past. Both of those I can kind of understand. I can get past that because, you know, maybe the servitors went nuts with the warp storm. Maybe the Imperial, the Explorator fleet was mostly in orbit and it disappeared in the warp storm. Maybe, maybe, maybe. And the Damocles Crusade, first one, well, I guess two and his were a big deal. So, you know, I guess... I guess I can understand it. But the second Damocles Gulf Crusade, I have to say, is where the majority of my Tau hatred comes from. In the fluff. Because in the second Damocles Gulf Crusade, it turns out that the Imperium of Man and the Space Marine chapters um, are all retarded. And they have a collective IQ of a small mayfly. Because if you read some of the stuff that goes on in the second Damocles Gulf Crusade, Damocles Crusade, it just, as an Imperial, it just makes you want to fucking just go to the Games Workshop Black Library writers and just shake them. So the two main bits of fluff I draw on in this is the book called Damocles, which is an omnibus of, of short stories, and the Montcast slash Cayun supplements. So let's start with the Damocles book. Now, this book is a collection of short stories that take place throughout the Damocles Gulf on various different planets, but mostly focused around the planet of Agrelin. And it's just so shit. So, 
this planet, Agrelin, I'm gonna, I mean, it, it, there's so many bad things, I, I almost don't know where to start. Like, this planet, Agrelin, is a hive world. Number one, it's a hive world, okay? Which means it's a big deal, okay? This isn't a normal world, this is a hive world. There are billions of humans on this planet, or there should be. You know, and it's been in the Imperium's control for a long time. And it's got vast military resources. That's what hive worlds are. But the Tau just turn up. They they land on the planet with no explanation of, of how they they land. They just land on the planet unmolested. And it's like there's no Imperial Guard on the planet. Like honestly, the space marines have to turn up. The uh, the white scars, and I have to say right now, someone needs to take uh, the leader of the white scars, Khan, take him and just blow his brains out because he's a fucking retard. Like he's a moron. Like the way his fluff is written, he just acts like an absolute idiot. And this is the crux of the issue. I'm not going to get into the the, the I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty. But essentially, the problem with this fluff is it makes the always makes the humans out to be mega mega incompetent like they're permanently really incompetent and the tau are made out to be strategic geniuses unparalleled in their ability to wage war nothing could stop them the only thing that can keep up with the mighty tau empire are the astartes and it's like well, hang on a second Hang on a second. Let's take a look at this, right? Because Space Marines, you know, Tau, Tau soldiers have been around for a relatively short period of time. You know, most of them would have been doing their military service for at max five to ten years. They're normal humans. They have, a, they have normal soldiers. They have a normal lifespan, roughly. Normal humanoid lifespan. You know, and the majority of their, of their soldiers are fire warriors. This is what we have to remember. The majority of Tau soldiers are fire warriors who aren't particularly competent. If you look at, you know, if if I know fluff and stats have a bit of a disconnect, but if you look at the stats of a Tau fire warrior, he's no braver than a guardsman. He's no more skillful at arms than a guardsman. If anything, he's less skillful in close combat. He's no tougher. He's no stronger. He's no more intelligent. If anything, his initiative is lower. Yet these guys... You know, from the ground up, from the pathfinders through to the through to the uh, fire warriors, through to the battle suits. These, this whole towel structure is just unparalleled in their strategic genius. Just unparalleled, and it's just, and it's you know, and and these people just, and Shadow Sun, who's meant to be this brilliant strategist, it's like okay, fair enough, she's good at what she does, but like. Every single trap that she lays for the Imperium, every single one of them, they fall for it without fail. Sometimes they even know it's a trap and they don't give a fuck. They're just like, well, ah, they may use traps, but we will use our martial pride to kill them. Rah, rah, rah. And it's like, what? You know, have a fucking semblance of military tactics. So not only am I pissed off because the Tau come across as these super, super awesome Mary Sue fucking tactics strategist. No one can beat us. My logic is undeniable. Tactics. The Imperium is made out to be super mega bunker busting, stupid, retarded. But the third thing is, is that the Imperial Guard are just, you know, the main fighting force. Are just completely sidelined. There's this one cool bit in the Damocles book when, you know, when you've got the, um, at the beginning, when you've got the Catachans turn up, led by Strachan. And Strachan's got a whole, like, one or two lines of dialogue. And then that's it. And the Imperial Guard just don't have any role to play in this entire campaign. And it's like, hang on. And I'm going to close this up now, this little section of it. But it's like, hang on. Let's really take stock here. You've got, at most, at most, 200 space rings on this planet. At most. You know, you've got... A chapter of the White Scars and a chapter of the Raven Guard. At most. You've got some Imperial Knights there. Okay, you've got about 10 Imperial Knights. Okay, cool. And you've got the Catachans there. You've got one regiment of Catachans, which pretty much outnumber everyone else there already. But what about all the other Guard forces? You're telling me that the Imperium sent one regiment to defend this planet. 
you know, one troop ship, essentially. It's like, what? What about all the planetary defence forces? I think there are 14 hive cities on this planet. 14 hive cities. Each one of those hive cities contains like, contain up to like 30, 40, 50 million people. I think some hive cities, the main hive cities, can contain like 100 million people. You're telling me none of the planet, like there's no mention of the planetary PDF forces. No mention of them whatsoever. They don't turn up, they don't do anything. They are not once mentioned in any way, shape or form. And it's like, whoa, like these Tau would be embroiled in an absolutely gruelling war. Like, I, we're being serious, like they would, there would be thousands upon thousands, nay millions of guardsmen defending this planet. It's a hive world. So that's where, yeah, it's just like, it's fucking retarded. It's just so stupid. Anyway, so that's in the Damocles book. Then we get on to the Montcast supplement. Okay. Which is meant to be all about the Cadians. Because the Cadian supplement was about the Raven Guard and the White Scars. And, you know, the Raven Guard chapter master died. And it was pretty sad. Uh, he was, oh yeah, by the way, a chapter master. Raven Guard chapter master, killed by Shadow Sun. Shadow Sun is, is I think... A teenage girl. A teenage girl killed a chapter master of one of the most ancient and venerable chapters of Space Marines. Can it get more stupid? Anyway, let's just get, you know, Montcast supplement, the, you know, the Imperium. They lost Agrelin, the Hive World. Oh, I forgot to say one thing, sorry. Another problem I have with the Tau Fluff is apparently they're able to take over 14 hive cities in one day. Unprecedented. Yeah, it's unprecedented because it's fucking impossible. Like, it's, I just can't get, I can't go into it anymore, guys. I'm sorry, you've got to read the book. It's, it, you've, you've you've it's almost worth paying the money to see how badly a written the book is. Like there's there's about seven or eight short stories in the book. In one of them, the Imperium has any semblance of a victory, and even then, the Tau still get out with the majority of their forces intact. It's just so dumb. The one battle the Imperium win in the Damocles book is when the Catachans can carry out a really cool ambush on this Tau column and they do they the Catachans do seriously fuck it up and it's a, it is a it is a good moment of glory for the guard but the rest of the book nothing um anyway getting on to the monk cast supplement th this is when this is when the divine intervention after divine intervention after divine intervention happens. Every time the Imperium are about to win, divine intervention. And it's just so tedious. So the book starts off going well. The Imperium launches the second Damocles Gulf Crusade to reclaim Agrelin. So they launch an entire crusade to take over this recently conquered planet. Now the Tower have apparently been reinforced in the suit. It's going to be a stepping stone for them. So you can understand they've got some defences there. This Imperial fleet turns up. And it's a huge, huge fleet turns up. And the battle goes really well at first. Like, they they take out the orbital. They crush the Tau Navy. They take out the orbital defences. Bit of a bit of a bolt upon moment, the, you know, when they're taking out the Imperial defenses, you know, space wing strikes, doing things, but it portrays the space wings perfectly. So when I first started reading this book, I was like, awesome, the games works where they pulled their fingers out, uh, and then the Imperial fleet starts descending to uh, counter orbital bombardments, but the Tau have got some amazing shields that can resist the majority of the orbital bombardments. So even though the Imperium bombards the fuck out of the planet no major tower assets are destroyed if any tower assets are destroyed you know very little damage is done to the tower despite the fact that there's an entire battle fleet uh, 
bombarding it. But anyway, anyway, let's carry on. So as the Imperial fleet starts to land troop transport, Shadow Sun reveals her amazing plan. She had hidden some of the orbital defence cannons, some of the ground-based defence cannons. She had hidden some of them. And she starts blowing the fuck out of the Imperium. And But fortunately, the Raven Guard, who were aware of this, they do a counter... They, they know her plan, so they counter her counter plan. So it's kind of cool. And again, th- at this point, you're thinking, OK, this is good. You know, they've wiped off the tower a little bit, describing how amazing Shadowson's plan is. But overall, this is going quite well. Then the Imperium lands its troops. But once again, this is when the Imperium starts to be shown... As fucking brain dead morons. Like just purely moronic. So. We all know the Imperial. They're the Cadians that land by the way. And they have. Apparently the only thing they land and attack with. Is infantry. And Lehman Russes. Despite like a paragraph earlier. It being said that the Imperium has absolutely amazing air cover. That they are ruling the skies. Like a, a page later, the Imperium has no air support. They're too busy with the Tau, with Tau flyers. And you're like, whoa, hang on. No, there, is, there aren't that many Tau flyers. The Tau don't have a lot of flyers. They have some flyers, but like the Imperium has fucking thousands and thousands of these of fighters available to them. It's a crusade, goddammit. No, 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 no. The, uh... The Imperium is, is, has no, no concept of, of, of air cover. No concept of air cover. Even though, a paragraph earlier, they, they said they needed the air cover and they had loads of it. Okay. A lot of artillery support. Oh, it gets mentioned. Uh, there's a whole th- two sentences dedicated to artillery support. I think it... Or maybe two lines. Something like, the Imperium starts deploying its artillery support. Then it's never mentioned again. Not once is it mentioned again. It's just like... So the Imperium get you know the Imperial Guard, the masters of combined ar- armed warfare, just get shown to have nothing but guardsmen and and Lehman Russes, and it's like okay, well I I like guardsmen and I like Lehman Russes, so whatever, let's carry on. But then it just becomes a shit show very quickly, and essentially every guard attack is met by awesome, super cunning, perfectly timed tactics of the Tau. And every time the Imperium gains a little bit of land, it's part of the Tau's greater plan. And they take it away from the Imperium. And no matter, even though the Imperium is made up of some of the best, even though the Imperial forces are made up of some of the best soldiers available to the Imperial Guard. And they've got chapters, they've got companies of space marines helping them. Despite all this, it's, you know, really bad you know, the Imperium are really struggling and everything is going wrong for them. And it just gets so stupid. And there's this point in this... And essentially, what happens is the Imperium are about to launch this final attack, or are launching this final attack to drive the tower off. And despite everything they've suffered through, despite all the super awesome fucking weeaboo tactics that the fucking space commies have thrown at them the imperium has prevailed or is about to prevail and they're about they're about to crush shadowson when suddenly divine intervention farsight of all the people to turn up farsight turns up where he comes from we don't know because the imperium fleet is literally described as setting up a planet-wide blockade where he comes from, it cannot be explained. So the Imperium is about to destroy the tower. They're about to win the battlefield for a Grelin. Win the battle for a Grelin. Farsight turns up. Divine intervention. Farsight, you thought Shadow Sun was oh so awesome and super tactical. So much strategy. What strategy? Huh. Farsight makes her look like a child. The intricate plans that he comes up with to smash the Imperium no matter where he is it's just stupid it's just stupid so there's a whole bit where like both sides end up like chilling out for a bit because reasons and this is so this is what pisses me off about this whole battle for a Glenn, right because what happens is 
the Imperial High Command starts getting worried. The war's dragging on too long. You know, the war's dragging on too long. If we, if, if we, we don't want to get drawn into this battle of attrition with the Tau. We have to have a final blow. And it's like, what the fuck? The Imperium. The Imperial Guard don't want a battle of attrition. Say what now? The faction. That... The faction that literally specialises in attrition warfare is worried about getting out-attritioned by the Tau. The people that have an empire the size of a pinhead on the galaxy map. So now apparently the Tau are better at attrition warfare than the Guard. Apparently. They're just better than, you know, attrition warfare. You know, pale Guard, we can't sustain these losses. We have to have a hammer blow. It's just like, it's just like, oh my god, what the fuck? So that's the, so. Let's just go through it. Basically, the tower been, the tower been saved by a warp storm. The tower been saved by the Tyranids. The tower have been saved by Farsight, a rebel who hates the Tower Empire, and now the Tau, the tower also. Apparently, greater strategists and combatants than the Space Marines, and better at attrition warfare than the Imperial Guard. Literally, I am, my face is so red from the amount. My face is scarlet with the huge levels of face palmification that I just felt. And it's just... I, you know, and it's just like this. And I'm going to wrap this segment up, this fluff, this fluff segment, right? Because it's it's gone on too long. This fluff segment. But like, honestly, it's like this in every single bit of Tau fluff. Nearly after the third edition codex, every single bit of Tau fluff, they just get wanked off so hard. The Tau are the best at absolutely everything, and it's just boring. It's just boring. Anyway, this video is going to be a long one, guys. So buckle up, because we haven't even covered the second part of the video, which is gameplay. How the Tau function on the tabletop. So, my number one sort of peeve with the Tau is when they were first, you know, before they came along, the Imperial Guard were the shooting faction. Every faction had its sort of, sort of niche. So Orcs were a horde army which specialised in close combat. Dark Elder were fast with raiders. Elder were sort of similar, you know. Were sort of similar, but obviously they both they were both quite distinct, the different factions, you know. Dark Elder were really fast and really slim, flimsy, where Elder were pretty fast and pretty flimsy, but really good psychers. And, you know, every faction had a unique thing. And then the Imperial Guard were the shooting faction. Like, Imperial Guard used to be, like, you shoot the shit out of your opponents. If the enemy manages to get a close combat with you, you're fucked. The Tau come along and they can do... It's exactly the same thing, yet they do it better than the Guard. So, I don't really... When they were first brought in, I can't really see what they were bringing to the table in terms of diversity to gameplay. You know. I mean, I guess... They were meant to be just... The cool thing that they brought to the fight was the battle suits. That was the unique thing. The crisis battle suits. Basically marines with two wounds. And that was kind of cool. But the problem was... Was that even in their inception... The first seeds of OP bullshit game breaking rules were introduced. So right from the beginning they were broken. Because they had jump shoot jump. So everyone else had, had jump packs jump pack infantry which very simply allowed you to move 12 inches and every other army obeyed it's going to sound funny but like i robot but every other army obeyed the three laws you move in the movement phase you shoot in the shooting phase and you charge in the assault phase tau come along and go no actually we're going to move in the assault phase as well so that assault armies will never ever get near us and it's true so 
even from the beginning, they, they have these game-breaking rules. And from a gameplay point, that is my number one pet peeve with the Tau. They just don't obey the rules. They just don't... They just cheat. And I've said this in one of my other... In my other videos, like... The reason some factions are really overpowered in comparison to others in Warhammer is... The factions that tend to be weaker tend to be the ones that actually stick to the rules. So the Imperial Guard don't have any like game breaking special rules. Like when we get a special like ability, it's normally like a reroll to hit. You know, a standard like in game mechanic. That's like our thing, you know, we but we still stick to the rules. We still move in the movement phase, shooting the shooting phase, assaulting the assault phase. We do everything as per the rules. We don't break any rules. We have very, very few army special rules. You know, the few that we do have, like orders, they increase our ability to carry out the game's rules. But we don't break them. You know, first one fire, second one fire, you get an extra shot. That's it. It's one extra shot. It's not changing one of the fundamental pillars of the game. Move, move, move. You know, move, move, move allows us to roll 3d6 and pick the highest for the run. But we still are only doing run. You know, we're still obeying that rule. The Tau, they're, they just break rules straight up. Like, they cheat flat out. And when you have a faction that is legally, within, within the confines of their codex, allowed to cheat, of course they're going to be better. So not only do you have jump, shoot, jump, but... You know, the infamous Riptide Wing. You know, that thing is just insane. Riptide Wing allows you to just break the rules of the game. Because it allows you to fire four times in one shooting phase. That essentially means you have been given, in one turn, four shooting phases. You know, not, you two might be saying, well, what's the difference between that and, like, you know, first rank fire, second rank fire? First rank fire, second rank fire, you only get one shooting phase. That's it. And the only weapon that that benefits is the las gun. So, you're still only getting this one sort of phase. You're not really, you know, it's just allowing you to essentially rapid fire at longer range. But you're still confined to the special, to the universal rules. But the storm side, so the storm side, the riptide wing, like ripple fire, double fire combined, literally means you get four shooting phases in one turn. You fire your weapon four times. It's just so obviously broken, and, and it's always been like this. One of the Tau have always been really overpowered. They they have been. Trust me, I've been playing against Tau since I've ever had Imperial Guard. Since 11 years of old, I've played against Tau. I know what I'm talking about. They are an overpowered, overpowered faction. One of the original Death Stars. You have Screamer Star, which is, which is a, one of the original. But in my living memory, the original Death Star unit was the Farsight Bomb. That was the original Death Star. Farsight Enclaves came out and they allowed you to take this unit, which was Farsight, with as many bodyguards as you could get, surrounded by as many drones as you could get. They all had amazing weapons and fantastic ballistic skill. And they all benefited from Farsight's no scatter deep strike. And they all had split fire, so you could put each weapon into a different target if you wanted to. And this thing would drop down without a scatter... And just fuck an entire army in one go. It was insanely powerful. It was one of the original OP things. <sighs> so it's just that's my that's my problem with the Tau. Like they're just and they're boring to play against. That's the problem. Like you know, because they they just shoot the shit out of you, and you don't feel like you can do anything about it. Because they're tough as well. That's the thing. Tau are really good at shooting. And they're really hard as nails. People say they have a downside. But they don't really. They're no worse in close combat. 
then a dedicate then any other non dedicated close combat army. You know, they're not, you know, in relative terms in relative terms, for a mob of orcs, thirty orcs with like a power claw, it's no harder for those orcs to crush a ten man tactical squad than it is for them to crush a ten man fire warrior squad. So when people say, Oh Tower weak in combat, it's like Well no, they're just as good at it as everyone else who doesn't specialise in it. They're just not specialised in close combat, but they're no worse than anyone else. They're just, you know, there's no real difference between weapon skill 2 and weapon skill 3. You know, no one's going to see, when you know, a corn berserker's not going to know the difference between fighting a, a fire warrior and fighting a, a guardsman. That's what I'm saying. Dedicated close combat units are really good at just fucking over any sort of non-dedicated close combat unit. So it doesn't matter if you specialise in it or not. If you've got an army that's good at close combat, it's going to be anyone who's not also kitted out to be that way in close combat. So it's not even... it is This this myth of tower bad in close combat, that's what balances them out, is, is just... It's false. What well, you've got to remember is Tau also are kind of not that bad in close combat. I mean, their battle suits have got two wounds each and... I think two attacks each and they're strength five and they've got a three plus armor save they're not that bad you know and the riptide everyone goes on about oh you know get a riptide in close combat it's like well okay if I charge a riptide with a bunch of guardsmen it's attacks are AP2 because it's a monster creature it's got a two plus save it's going to have a feel no pain it can have up to a three plus invulnerable save like it's got a decent number of attacks it's got four attacks like riptide isn't that bad in close combat. It's just like any other monster's creature. And I think the Riptide, I don't even know if there's any point in going into it. We all know why the Riptide is just a fucking joke. It has no... The Riptide is one of those models that has literally no disadvantages. It can hold its own in close combat. If it wants to, it can hit and run. You can pay for it to have hit and run, so it doesn't even stay in close combat. Um, it's got good shooting... Anyone who says, oh, it's only got Blitz Skill 3, look, just fuck off. It's got a fucking... It's got good shooting. But the main durability of it is its toughness. 2 plus armor save. Toughness 6. 5 plus invun. Can go up to a 3 plus invun. 5 plus feel no pain. If you put a toe in cover, it gets a cover save. It's just... The thing is just stupidly powerful. I think that's where the major I think up until the... I'll give... I will throw this bone to tile players. Up until the Riptide came out. Even with things like far, even to a certain degree with Farsight Bomb, but not really. Up until it's really up until Farsight Bomb and Riptides came out, the Tau was okay to face. They were powerful, they were really powerful, they were OP, but you could beat them. With a little bit of luck, a little bit of skill, you could beat them. Not so anymore. Tau, one of those factors. Put it this way, there is a reason why Tau play players gather so much hate. Okay, there is a reason why Tau have become more hated than Eldar and more hated than Space Marines. You know, does that, do I really need to say much more about that? Another thing I want to say is, another problem with the Tau is that their codex is so, it, it's so badly internally imbalanced like you have units in there which you would never ever ever take not even for fun you know vespid sting wings are just a joke you would never ever ever take them the guard codex has a weak elite section but you're not outrightly crippled and handicapped by taking some of the things in the elite section you know ogrins will still do all right bulgrins will still do all right rattlings will do pretty well you know, you'll do all right. But fucking the Vespid Stingwings are a joke. And so are the crew, like the crew, unfortunately. The crew are my favourite part of the Tau. And they're just, there's no real point in taking them unless you want to take a cheap troop stack. That's it. And I think this is what, it, what I'm trying to come down to here is that because the Codex is so broken and so badly internally balanced so there's some things which are so obviously far and away better 
in the code, it's like, you know, Riptide Spam, for example, that the army can be turned into a power army very easily. And this means that it can take incredibly little skill to win with the Tau. I'm not saying every Tau army out there is, hard, is easy to win with. No. I've seen plenty of Tau battles where people take a cool, balanced army where they take you know, some troop choices and devilfishes, a hammerhead here, maybe even a couple of riptides, you know, but they've got a, they've got a nice balanced selection. And and they have a good fight. And I've fought against an army armies like that. My brother's Tau, he regularly takes a couple of units of stealth teams, Riptide, uh maybe um he takes bodyguards with uh missiles with uh buff commander, he takes a Riptide, a couple of Hammerheads, a uh, couple of squads of crew. It's a nice balanced army. And whenever we play, it comes down to the wire. It, it, it literally is. like it, It's properly down to the wire. And it's it's a few dice rolls either way tend to make out either who wins. And most of the time we draw. So it really is. That's the example of a, of a good tower army. But the problem is it's so easy for someone to go... Yeah, here's my Riptide wing. Here's my nine Riptides at 1850. And trust me when I say Riptide spam takes very little skill to win with. There's a, there's a man at my club who we won't name by name. And he, for a period of time, ran Riptide spam. And he would he, he was quite a lazy chap. He was quite a lazy chap. And he often collected the. He often used the. He was a power gamer. You we all know he was a power gamer. He was that fucking guy. And he would set up his riptides. He'd, he'd, he'd come up, you know, he'd come up, he'd, he'd, you'd arrange a game with him and you knew what you were getting into. But if you needed a game at the club and. He'd set up and he wouldn't move. He'd sit, he'd plonk himself down in a chair. He would, pl he would literally plonk himself down in a chair and he'd just set up this land of riptides. And he would just shoot you. And he would keep shooting you. And he would keep shooting you. And no matter what you did, he just shot you. And he never moved for the first three turns of the game. Didn't need to. Didn't, didn't get out of his chair. He just sat on his chair, fucking food and food to the side, food and drink next to him, shoving it into his face, rolling dice. Like, and it was just boring. And it was an unpleasant experience. And... He took no skill for him to win that game. It took no skill for him to win that. He just literally went, right, I'm going to keep shooting that target. I'm, going to, I'm just going to shoot that target. Right, I'm going to shoot that target. And it was just... He had a load of marker lights as well, guys, just before you say. He had a bunch of marker lights as well. So not only can, not only can the army be set up to win with very little skill... And not only is it incredibly frustrating to play when you just get shot off the table and your opponent is like, oh, look at my amazing tactics. It's also an army that generally attracts that fucking guy. Honestly. Some of the Tau players that I have come across, nay, many Tau players that I've come across, and I know Tau players that are out there, I know you're not all like this. Like I said, my brother... He has Tau and he has Blood Angels. And he loves his Blood Angels. He hasn't used his Tau in a long time, but he loves his Blood Angels. But he is a Tau player. And I know a couple of other Tau players. They're good guys. They bring nice armies. They bring good, but, but tough. They don't take it easy on you. But so many Tau players that I have come across have been some of the most arrogant and some of the most smug assholes that you can ever come across. And I know it's true of, it could be true of any faction. But let me put it to you this way, guys. Have you ever met an orc player who's a dickhead? No, you don't. Because people who collect orcs, people who are stuck with orcs all this time, look, play with them because they're, they're fun. You know, when you play, I've been to a tournament where one orc player turned up, it was me, I was the only Imperial Guard player, and he was the only orc player, and the other 60 guys had whatever flavour of the month armies, 
every it was so funny the first time he he threw down in that tournament. He set his models up, he green tied by the way, set his models up and he started playing, blah blah blah, and suddenly halfway through his first game and he was playing against a notor you know, a notorious tournament player who does the circuit. And halfway through the game, he gets about turn three or four and he's in position to do his, his charge. And this definitely loud wah, like a proper wah, comes, just echoes across the game and all. And everyone turns around. And this guy is stood on his chair, wahing, beating his chest. And the look on his opponent's face was like, <laughs> you know, he didn't know what to do. But no, you know, and I ended up playing against the guy, and he was one, that, and I voted him as best player of that tournament because he was an absolute nutter. And we, it was pure infantry guard versus pure infantry orcs. We only got to turn four. Yeah, we had like four hundred models between us on the table. We only got to turn four, <laughs> but it was amazing. And I won the game. And I'm not saying I enjoyed the game because I won the game because it literally came down to the last few dice rolls. I might have to do a bayonet charge and drive off one of his shattered orc mobs off an objective. But that's what I'm saying. You know, you don't come across dickhead orc players. You don't really come across, and I'm not biased, obviously, but you don't really come across dickhead Imperial Guard players. Most Imperial Guard players collect them, and they collect a themed army. I've yet to see an Imperial Guard power player. You come across, you know, apart from myself, obviously, guys. Ho, ho, ho. No, I'm joking. You know, I've yet to come across an Imperial Guard power player. Most people that are Imperial Guard players collect a themed list. And I have evidence for this. Because when I was doing my list reviews, which guys, the list reviews will be coming back when 8th edition gets started, by the way. But when I was doing my list reviews, all the lists that got sent in to me were themed. Well, the vast majority of them, if you guys go back and watch them, they were themed lists. They were fluffy lists. You know, you had, I can't remember what the guy's name was now. I think it was, I can't remember. But he sent me in this themed talent list and like everyone had like plasma guns. And it was cool as fuck. You know, I had another guy who, who sent me in a list, and I don't know if I just, I think I just sent him an email back rather than did a list review. But he sent me in this list, and it was, it was, and I don't know a lot about American military, but it was all based on like combat engineers, the CBs. If you guys know more about that, obviously leave a comment. And it was cool as fuck, man. It was shit. It, like, I'm going to be honest, his list was not competitive in any way. What I'm saying is you don't come across these dickheads with certain factions. When you've got a faction which is a bit weak, the people that play them are just guys who like the game and want to play them. Tau, because they were so easily exploitable, it was like the holy ground of dickhead players. The holy ground. Like, it got so bad in some of my gaming groups that I had a game against a chap and I actually ended up just refusing never to play with him again. I had three games against him. And the more I played it, you know, not at the same time, over, over a period of time, over about a month, I think it was, I had three games against him. And it just got to the point now where he would ask me for a game and I'd say no. I just avoided him. And he ended up getting avoided by everyone. And the only people that he plays now, because he had, you know, I went over to his house. It was like he had his own little gaming setup. And the only people he plays now, like this group of people that just are complete noobs and he just noob stomps that's all he does he's just a noob stomper and when and whenever we've like dragged him to tournaments or leagues or whatever he just he bows out after the first like couple of games because he gets his ass handed to him because he's not a particularly good player so when he comes across a player that is good he gets his ass handed to him and he's a dickhead and he has this huge tower army and elder army and it's just like ugh, whatever whatever so this is a long, long video, guys. This is like an hour long. And there's more I could go on about. You know, we, I, even, I even covered the most obvious one. Why the fuck are the tower even in 40k? You know, why are they even there? They're, 40k is grim dark. The Tau, when they were first introduced in their third edition codex, they were the good guys, okay? I don't care what that, you know, they've had some reveals now to try and make them fit in with the, uh, with the 40k universe. But when the Tau were brought in, they were brought in for one reason, to be the good guys. And they are completely and utterly at odds with the 41st, with the 40k universe. There's no, 
they're so jarringly out of focus that it's just when you read the stuff it makes you think am i reading a 40k novel am i reading a 40k bit of fluff you know it's just so i just why are they here and at the end of the day let's let's address another factor why are they even like a faction that we can buy and play i know i've said this before but their empire is tiny and insignificant go and read the second last chapter's book last chances book sorry there's a trilogy of book called the last chances about a penal about the 13th penal legion run by colonel Schaffer. in the second book they get colonel Schaffer forms a team of scum to carry out an assassination mission on the tau and they have to go undercover and if, you know, I have to go undercover. And at one point, the main character of the book is talking to a Tao diplomat and a Tao, because um, they're undercover as, as, as diplomats. And they go undercover as a, he's talking to a Tao diplomat and a Tao admiral. And he says, and the Tao are talking to him, and they're like, what, where, what's the planet like where you come from? And he says, oh, well, the planet I come from is Olympus. It's a hive world. And on that, on that planet, there are... You know, I, I you know it's a, it, I, there are like thirteen hive cities, and each one of these hive cities has like a billion people in it. You know, it's crazy. And the Tao look at each other and go, "That is impossible." And he says, "Well, no, it's not. It's where I come from." Like, no, that is impossible. There are more people in that one planet. There are more humans on that one planet than there are the Tao in the entire Tao Empire. You know, these guys are nothing thing. Like, there are other factions out there that have got bigger empires which aren't represented in the, in the fluff. Like, you know, random example, the Harud. Whether you want the Harud to be like the Skaven Harud or the Time Warping Harud, the Harud could be an awesome faction. There's... They, they have these huge migrations and they are in it, like they're in the fabric of the 40k universe like they're everywhere they're like you know the vermin but they are a faction they have significant colonies and stuff can you imagine a bunch of like dirty sneaky scavenger kind of scavenger kind of people that use time weapons to warp like literally time weapons to warp their enemies like their guns would, wouldn't like fire bullets or lasers they would if you got hit by one of their guns you would like i don't know if that's how it works but it'd be a cool in implementation if you got hit by one of their guns you like aged like by like 100 years and died how cool would that be like really like that'd be awesome nope they don't have a faction uh i don't know how you pronounce this but the the locks at all the weird amphibious reptilian guys from the uh, uh, Tanith books, Tanith first and only books, the Gaunt's Ghost books. Those guys, they're an entire like they're like a mercenary race. They're evil as fuck. They have like their they have like a whole, they've got established fluff. They've got these these fletchet blasters, basically like really really nasty weapons. They're pretty prevalent in the. Uh, pretty prevalent in the fluff do they have a book no are they a focus of anything in the 40k millennium no you know the the rack gull proper evil fucking giant snake men empire which genuinely the imperium is kind of afraid of do they have a book no enslavers you know one of the most deadliest threats the imperium can face if you get an enslaver infestation on your planet you have to exterminate it. it's the only way do they have a book? No. They're so... Like, the Kroot. The Kroot are more interesting than the Tau. You know, an entire Kroot-based army would be really awesome and interesting. An entire faction that can eat people and or eat their enemies and gain the genetic traits. That's, I mean, I know it's kind of a bit like the Tyranids, but it's not the same. We know that it's not the same. Like, 
can you imagine some of the adaptations that you could have with a full crew army? Awesome. You know, uh, the Torellians, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, the dog soldiers. Back in the day, they had an empire that could rival the humans. And I think it was during the Great Crusade that they got their face smashed in and they've never forgiven humanity. What about if there was like the Torellian remnant as a faction, the dog soldier remnant? They don't have a book, they don't have a faction. What I'm trying to get across here, guys, this is what I want to sign off on. What I want to sign off on is there are so many other factions in the 40k universe that were already established that already had fluff and background and stuff developed for them and that are more interesting than the tower that would play more interesting you know you know from a sort of theory hammer point of view they would play they could play really interestingly in comparison and that are more unique than the tower there are these there are empires bigger than the tower empire which have been crushed which get crushed by the imperium on a daily basis so why are these guys given this special treatment every time they get they get close to being destroyed divine intervention and trust me i have listed like two or three instances of divine intervention Go and read some of the tile fluff. It's rife with divine intervention. Deus ex machina is what people say. Like, it is just rife with just plot armor, weeaboo shields, just... Just boring. So, to finish off my salty, salty, hour-long rant about the towel. To summarize, one, their fluff is boring, unbelieving, Unbelievable, I should say. The fluff is boring. It's unbelievable. It's unimaginative. It makes the tower look like absolute super intelligent IQ of 9,000. It makes the Imperium look like a bunch of brain-dead morons. Their fluff is poorly written. After, after the third edition codex, the fluff is poorly written, uninspiring, and not even fun to read. On the tabletop, the tower play... Like their fluff, they're boring to play against. They don't interact with you on the set, on, on, in all three phases. Often they will set up and shoot. There are, there are there is a bit of movement for end game objective grabbing, but Tower have always just had this set up and shoot, and that's it. They're boring in the fluff. They're boring to play against. The people that tend to collect Tau just are not nice people to play against. Unfortunately, I think that's a symptom of the Tau faction itself. I believe if the Tau were as weak as the Orcs are now in 7th edition, I believe you wouldn't have any of that fucking guys playing Tau. My honest opinion is, if 8th edition comes out and Tau have been nerfed into oblivion, then, then they'll, be be they'll be better. I think there'll be less that fucking guys playing them. But yeah, that's it. That, that's it, guys. That's my tower rant. I just can't fucking stand them. I can't fucking stand them. Um, I just don't think they bring anything to the 40k universe. I just don't like them in any way, shape, or form. I think if Tau... If, if tomorrow Games Workshop said, Look, guys. Tau. We had a good run with them, but we're discontinuing every... They got squatted. We're discontinuing every model. We're no longer supporting them. All the books you have for them are no longer relevant. And yeah, you can't use Tau anymore. I wouldn't notice the difference. The fluff, the fluff wouldn't notice the difference. No one would give a shit. In the, in the, in the, in the Warhammer universe, no one would give a shit. And that's what it comes down to at the end of the day. The Tau are such an insignificant race. Such an insignificant part of the 40k universe. In, you know, that if they were removed tomorrow, who gives a fuck? Good riddance. If you get rid of the Imperium, that's a major plot development. If you get rid of Chaos, that's a really major plot development. If you get rid of the Orcs, that's a huge problem. If you get rid of the Tyranids, who the fuck's going to eat everyone? You get rid of the Necrons, who's going to harvest everyone? You get rid of the Dark Elder, who are the 
who enslave entire cities that are the reason for the birth of Slanesh, a quarter of the chaos in the galaxy. That's a big deal. Getting rid of the towel? Pfft, wouldn't even remember. Getting rid of the who, I say? Getting rid of the who? Exactly.